So it's my pleasure now to introduce our next expert, uh, Dr. Dale Stevens. Dr. Dale Stevens is an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at York University. He's the director of the York MRI facility and the Cognition and Aging Neuroscience and Neurointervention Lab, CAN. He, now he uses a combination of a lot of neuros, so neuropsychological, neuroimaging, neurostimulation, and neurofeedback techniques to study large-scale brain systems and processes that underlie higher level cognition in humans. How these are affected by healthy aging and neurodevelopmental disorders, and also to develop neurointervention strategies to enhance cognitive performance. He's also a pretty decent pool player. Over to you, Dale. <laughs> Thank you, Suzanne, <clears throat> and thanks, Fran, for an incredibly engaging and eye-opening talk. Uh, and thanks to everybody who's here listening and RCI for inviting us to be part of this panel. I'm really excited. I think we have a, a good lineup where um, Dr. Wilkinson started from lower level perception and how important seeing and eyesight perception is um, in aging. I'm going to be talking a little bit about sort of more higher level cognitive aspects of cognitive aging. Uh, and then when we have Dr. Gary Turner at the end, he'll be moving towards more sort of social aspects that relate. And we're all talking about ways that we can try and uh, mitigate or, you know, make some of these declines that we think about in aging <clears throat> a little bit better. Okay, so with that, I am going to talk about a lot of neuro things today. And hopefully by the end, that won't be uh, confusing or such a mouthful. So reversing age-related cognitive decline, <clears throat> and that's sort of the goal of what we're working on in my lab and with some of my collaborators. And we use techniques of cognitive neuroscience, including neuroimaging, neurostimulation and neurofeedback. Okay, so just a quick roadmap of where I'd like to go in my <clears throat> talk today and the time that I have. First, just sort of a quick summary of what do we know about cognitive aging? And I'm gonna talk about the fact that, you know, we know some aspects of cognition decline, but there are other aspects of cognition that improve. And in general, we can look at it as a shift in our cognition. And I'll say more about that. Well, what do we know about the uh, aging brain? Well, um, a lot, we've been using neuroimaging, so something like functional magnetic resonance imaging, is what I will talk about, um, to, to really, you know, we have incredible advanced tools now where we can look inside and sort of see the activity of the brain and the real living human brain in real time or in, in, in complex models. Uh, and what, what I look at are changes in these large scale brain networks. It can be complicated, I wanna try and break that down to a fairly simple story, I think, that relates to cognitive aging. Uh, last, you know, once we talk about changes in behavior and in the brain with aging, what can cognitive neuroscience do about it? Is there anything we can do? So I want to talk a little bit about some of the experiments and initiatives we've been working on in my lab, where we're trying to modulate brain networks using the tools of cognitive neuroscience to enhance cognition. And one stream of research, this is using non-invasive brain stimulation, something called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And another line of research, we're doing what we call neurofeedback training. Okay. So to jump in, what do we know about cognitive aging? Well, um, I think a lot of us fear as we get older that you know aging just comes with this consistent sort of slow or maybe rapidly increasing decline across a lot of different aspects of cognition. A lot of us think about memory and attention. And there are some reasons to be concerned about it. This is a, a very um, a famous seminal study, um, fairly old now, but that looked at a number of different kinds of cognitive tasks. Now, if you look at these graphs, there are four of them here. Each one of these graphs shows a line that represents how well a group of adults are performing on a task. And these are several different tasks that are all related to processing speed. Here are some tasks with working memory, long-term memory, and short-term memory. And so, you know, the higher you are on this scale, the better you're doing, and the lower the worse. And as you can see here, these are the decades of the participants in the studies from their 20s to 80s, right, on each of these studies. And so we see that across some of these domains, there are sort of linear declines in our general performance on these kinds of tasks. Um, and we can see though that they start around, you know, in the, in the 20s. I mean, it's, uh, we get a little bit of an increase in decline in the later years, but this is just a natural part of typical healthy aging. Um, and it can be a concern, but that's not the whole story. There are aspects of cognition that, you know, in, in the absence of some sort of pathology, like a neurodegenerative disease or dementia, can improve across the whole lifespan. So this is um, knowledge-based verbal ability. So verbal ability and just general knowledge of the world, um, concepts and our understanding of things. That expected decrease across the lifespan. So really the way to characterize this would be um, really a shift where we, we have, there's more of a shift as you age from what includes declining fluid cognition, we call it, but preserved crystallized cognition. So fluid cognition are those tasks where we need 
um, novel information, learning new associations, or fast, you know, in the moment, flexible kind of um, cognition, fast, flexible cognition. Whereas crystallized cognition relates more to sort of retained, stored knowledge and understanding of the world across lifespan. And so there's a shift between these functions. Okay, well, what do we know about the brain? A lot of what we know about the brain and aging um, comes from functional MRI. Now, this is a magnetic resonance imaging machine here. We have one here at York University. Um, and functional MRI is the ability to look at a marker of brain activity. So we can actually get an idea of what parts of the brain are engaged or active or are communicating when people are doing different kinds of cognitive tests. And if, if we look at it from this large scale brain systems or network perspective, it can get kind of complicated. But I think we've been talking about something we think of as a fairly simple model, or we call it the three network model or three net, which actually um, can explain a lot of what we see in cognitive aging. So I'm gonna try and break that down in a way that makes sense out there today. And I'm gonna talk about just these three networks. One that we call the attention network, one we call the default network, and one I'm gonna call the control network, okay? So a little more about these. Well, you can, what you can see here, this is the two networks put onto a surface of a brain. This is basically looking at uh, a model or image of somebody's brain that was taken with an MRI scan. So these, all these regions that you see in blue here are part of this default network that I mentioned here. And all these regions in red you see on the brain are part of what we call this attention network here. And what we know is that the attention network is critically important for when we are focusing on the external world. We're looking out in the environment around us. We need to see things, we need to act, take in information, navigate, hear what's going on. Anything involved in focusing out there in the perceptual environment involves the, the attention network. But it, and another very important part of human mental life and, and our survival in the world is the ability to introspect. That is to look inside the mind. That, that involves retrieving memories, uh, remembering things, drawing on our knowledge, um, trying to remember our plans and goals. What am I doing right now? If I'm going to the store or am I going to work? Um, all of these things are internal representations. And we need to be able to simultaneously toggle back and forth or integrate information from what's going on around us out there in the perceptual world to what we know about the world, you know, to how to understanding the things that we see based on our memory and activating our plans and goals as we move about the world. And so how do we think that we do these things? So the, we see that these networks are anti-correlated. We look in the brain, when one of these networks, say the red network is all active and you know, the neurons are firing and we see a lot of signal in the MRI, the blue regions of the default network is very suppressed or very low, it's not active. On the flip side, when we, when we look inward or we're trying to remember something or we're trying to imagine what we'll do in the future or make plans, the regions in blue or the default network becomes very active and the red regions or attention network becomes deactivated. I'm gonna bring in one more network called the control network here and that's down here in green. We think of this network as being sort of the seed of our higher volitional control, our ability to direct our focus where we want. So we're not at the whim of things popping up in our environment or random memories and thoughts coming up. We actually have some control over where we're focusing. So this control network, we think the job of this is to toggle back and forth and engage either the default network when we're doing internal cognition or the attention network when we're paying attention to the world around us. Summarize that, here we go. Putting all these networks, this is how these networks look like when all, all in the brain together. So again, the blue regions are default network for involved in internal cognition. The red regions are involved in external cognition. And these green regions sort of, they become active and they couple with the default network when we're thinking internally, or they let go and they couple with the attention work network when we're looking outward. So it toggles back and forth. Well, what happens in aging? We know that the default network, which I've been mentioning, seems to be particularly susceptible to some age-related decline or even Alzheimer's disease pathology in an extreme case. This is what we've talked about as the default network. We can just see, if you look at amyloid deposition, which is a marker of um, brain lesions in Alzheimer's, it looks like a similar pattern. We look at regions of the brain that shrink a little bit in Alzheimer's disease, or where we see metabolic disruption. The pattern looks very much the same here, here, and here. That's where we're arguing. So the default network seems to be particularly susceptible. We also know that there's a reduced suppression of this network when older, in older adults when they're doing an externally focused task. So a lot of time in the laboratory, we're engaging people in some sort of a task where they're looking at images and making responses. Of course, this happens in the real world as well. And in a typical health, young brain, what we see is that the blue regions become very suppressed when we're doing an externally focused task. And we see these bright regions coming online. We look at an older, um, a brain of older adults, or even people who have are suffering from dementia, what we see is we don't see that decline or that suppression of the blue regions. We see a lot more activity in the brain. 
Well, what does this mean? Again, um, what we think it means here, and a lot of this work is actually done by Dr. Turner, who will be speaking next, and his colleague Nathan Sprang, something they call the default executive coupling hypothesis of aging. And that is that there seems to be a sticky or an increased link or a stable stuck link between the control network and the default network. Now this might reflect the fact that older adults rely much more on their uh, crystallized cognition, their semantic knowledge, that sort of lifelong built up knowledge of the world and facts. Or it might represent something maladaptive uh, about the brain. Um, and so that's something we need to understand. So what is the relationship between what I've said about the brain and what we said we saw about cognitive activity? Well, the idea here is that as we get older, there seems to be an increased linkage or, or a, a fixation between this control network and the default network, which involves accessing our stored knowledge, uh, thinking inward or making plans. And so the, to the extent that that happens, it, we might, that might be some, some of what's responsible for or related to decreases on these fluid cognitive tasks, but increases in these crystallized tasks. Okay. So what can we do about it? Um, I want to talk about two examples of how we're trying to modulate large scale brain networks to try and enhance, or you know, what we'd like to say, we would like to reverse age related cognitive decline. So it's a tall order and it sounds kind of, kind of bombastic and ambitious, but I think we're making some traction here and I think it's possible and we've got some early evidence to show that we can do this. And again, I want to talk about a couple of really exciting sort of cutting edge tools that are available to cognitive neuroscientists now that allow us to not only look inside the living thinking brain, like neuroimaging, but also to actually have some sort of effect on it, to modulate the activity of the brain, modulate the activity of these networks, and potentially have a beneficial effect. So the first thing I like to talk about is, it's a non-invasive brain stimulation, and it's called transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS. So this is a picture from a setup in my laboratory. There's a chair, it looks kind of like a dentist chair, but it's a nice comfy chair for a participant to sit in, who's not there. We have something, this is just the coil. And in the end, these are not, not extremely complicated. It's a, it's a figure of eight with two round coils. And when you pass some electric current through there, it causes a magnetic field. So this is a, a mock-up of a coil against the side of somebody's scalp here. And that magnetic field crosses the skull and the scalp and has an effect on the neurons in the cortical surface just un there under. And it can actually, what it can cause is um, an increase. It can potentiate um, electrical firing of the neurons there, or it can, it can suppress it and introduce noise into the system. So the idea here is that what we can do, with this, and it's, you know, you don't, you don't really feel anything. We consider it non-invasive because it's just a coil held on the surface of the skull. But using something called neuronavigation, we can get images of a brain and use a computer model and cameras to, to determine exactly where in the brain we're stimulating the cortex. Okay, and if we can do that in a non-invasive way, maybe we can, you know, actually affect some changes in the brain that might improve cognitive performance or help, you know, reverse age-related cognitive performance. So a very good colleague of mine uh, who works at Harvard Medical School named Mark Halko had a seminal study showing that if, here's an example of a brain here. So this is like the left side of somebody's cortical surface and this is sort of the medial as if you split the hemispheres in half and look at the medial surface. These orange regions are what we call the default network, which I've been talking about. And he showed that if you actually isolate a particular node of that individual people and take a TMS coil and of course put it just outside the head and you stimulate regions, depending on where you stimulate in the brain, you can get different effects. So this down here looks like a small brain. It's part of the brain called the cerebellum, which is right back here, bottom of one. What he showed was that you stimulate this region with a particular kind of frequency of stimulation. You see these blue regions here, that's part of the default network that you've now suppressed the connections. So within this default network, you can actually quiet down the activity and sort of suppress the communication across that network. If you stimulate a different region with different frequency, you can actually enhance or increase activity of the default network. So not only are we sort of affecting the spot on the, on, the, you know, on the cortical surface that we're stimulating, we can have effects that spread throughout brain networks. This is a very promising technique. Okay, so I just wanna show you what we did with this. We have, we have an early experiment with some preliminary results that are very exciting. So again, this is a brain that shows the blue is the default network, the red is this dorsal tension network, and the green is called the control network. We used MRI in, in a number of younger and older adults to isolate this critical node. This is called the, pri in the parietal lobe here. And we decided to target the same spot, as close as we could, the same spot in each subject's brain with TMS to see if we could affect you know, network level changes in a way that might be beneficial. And here's some results of what we found. And so we're, we're I have a little lightning bolt to represent where we stimulated. Of course, not a lightning bolt, but a mild stimulation here. So when we did this with young adults, we see this is blue regions are part of this default network here. We stimulated there. 
I'm going to walk you through quickly what happened. So this scale shows you how high the activity was. We, so we stimulated the brain, and then we went and put them in an MRI scanner and said, how, you know, how active or how much of these networks communicating after we stimulated the brain? Because the effects last. So the blue bars are what they looked like before they had stimulation. And then we stimulated their brains, put them back in the MRI scanner. What you can see is there was a decrease in functional connectivity and activation in the default network in these young adults. So this stimulation decreased default network activity. What it also did was it made a change to how this default network was talking to the control network. So from here to here, you can see these regions change. Okay. And that was interesting. And probably not something that's going to help someone perform a task. However, we were targeting older adults because we wanted to change this idea where older adults don't suppress this default network and seem to not to be able to switch between their external and internal cognitive focus very well as well. So same thing, we stimulated this same brain region in a number of older adults, and we saw something very striking. So what we showed here are two regions of the default network, here and here. And in both instances, the solid bars show what the brain looked like before stimulation, and then what that default network looked like after. And what we're showing here is that we actually were able to increase the integrity and connections of this deep, all important default network in the older adults. Maybe more importantly though, when we looked at the connection between the default network and this attention network, uh, we saw that there was some slight connection there where they should be pointing in opposite, opposite directions. So what happened after we stimulated these brains and these lines here was that it decreased, um, it decreased the, the, the connection there. So this actually is exactly, we changed the pattern of brain activity a little bit so that it looks much more like a younger brain. Now, some preliminary data also showed that these older adults were able after this to produce more details of memories in, in a memory test we were doing in the lab, which I don't have time to go into great detail. Okay, I wanna shift gears now and say, that was an interesting effect that we had uh, in, in the laboratory. Uh, and we are looking at developing sort of neurointervention techniques that might work out there in the real world. But I want to switch gears and talk about something that where we are trying to do that now called neurofeedback training. And this is kind of a simple idea. This is just a little drawing here of an individual who's got some kind of a, uh, you know, a system on the head that can measure, measure what we call EEG, which is electroencephalography. And this is, you know, what these are electrical waves that you can read outside of the skull, outside of the scalp, to reflect underlying neural activity. And you can see this with people using things like lie detectors or looking at sleep cycles where you have the needle on the page. So we know something about that. You can read those signals and then actually take that information and feed it into some sort of a, of, of a machine, like in this case, this is a mobile application like a smartphone or a, or, a, or a tablet, and have that information somehow sent back to the individual. It's sort of a positive feedback loop. They can actually learn to increase certain kind of brain activity, to increase activity in certain parts of the brain or decrease certain parts of the brain. Um, and it's, it's done through an implicit learning technique. So the user can, you know, brain activity, they can modulate their own brain activity, um, and it's done through you know, implicit rewards or deterrence. And so you start forming an association between a particular behavior and a consequence. So uh, I'll say a little more about that. An example would be, you know, I'm reading brain activity, and I'm, you know, my goal is to try and increase a certain kind of brain signal that I know shows that you're engaging your control network more, which can help you focus and have better memory. And that is a signature. Well, the more that your brain is showing that activity, and maybe you're, you're, you have some sort of feedback that gives you a reward saying, hey, that's, you're doing well. You know, and if that activity starts to, starts to suppress, then you get a signal saying, hey, it's not doing as well. And over time, you, even if you're not sure how you do it, you learn to change the, the brain activity in your brain. And almost, this works for almost everybody who tries it. The problem is that early studies showing that you can use this to enhance cognitive performance, like memory and attention in older adults, is very much laboratory based. And that's an intense, you know, very sort of complicated setup that takes a long time. To go into a lab, it takes a long time to set up. So this is an example. It's not really practical to bring people, you know, necessarily bring people into the lab daily to have these kinds of sort of training sessions. So I'm working with a company that's developing mobile techniques. So nowadays there are these cool headbands you can buy that measure EEG, electroencephalography. You can wear a walk around in the world. And you may have seen people wearing these things. Uh, one system is called Muse. There are other kinds. You can buy them in stores. Um, now these things pair with a smartphone, like a, you know, an iPhone or a tablet. And I'm working with, so I'm working with a company called Extensa Labs who developed um, software that reads this information and builds it into kind of like a little video game device where you're watching yourself biking through the mountains of Corsica in Italy, beautiful scene. And so the more you ramp up a particular kind of brain activity, the faster the bike goes and the more beautiful the scenes are and the more the music is nice. And if you're not doing the right kind of brain activity, it's kind of slows down. And over multiple sessions, the idea is that people should learn to amp up a certain kind of brain activity. 
Now, the ultimate idea here is that it's like going to the gym. You know, when you go to the gym and you say do curls to you know, work on building up your biceps, the goal isn't usually just so that you're better at doing curls in the gym. The idea is that you improve your strength. It's going to help you in lots of aspects of life. It's the same way here. This exercise is supposed to have lasting effects that then should have generalizable benefits in other kinds of tasks. Okay, so it's a real-time neurofeedback you can do in the comfort of your own home or a coffee shop or wherever you are. Yeah, just have a couple more minutes and I'll wrap up. I wanna show you some preliminary studying results from this on a graph here. So this represents 24 training sessions. We had, we had 28 people doing the neurofeedback training with the headset, and then we had 17 control or what we call sham subjects who were getting feedback that wasn't actually related to their brain activity to see if we got improvements. The first thing we noticed is that this red line shows the sham people who weren't getting real neurofeedback training, and their, their brain activity kind of stayed the same, went up and down from session to session. If you look at the blue line here, this is the, the, neuro, the activity of the neurofeedback training group, and it has increased at almost every time point, showing that they were, in a, they were able to use this feedback to ramp up this kind of brain activity, which we think of as being related to the control network. Okay. Well, how did it affect their memory? Well, we also tested them on some memory attention tasks before they started training. They then did 24 training sessions, which were about 15 minutes long, mostly in their own home, over a couple of weeks, and then we tested their performance again. Okay, so we had measures of attention. One is alerting, how fast can you just alert your attention to something? One is how well are you able to alert your attention to the right spot in space when you're cued? And conflict is how well are you able to attend to something when you have competing or conflicting information? Okay, so the blue lines, the red lines here represent the sham group. We didn't get real free training. And as you can see, from before and after training in each session, they stayed about the same. These red lines are flat in pre post. However, the blue lines show the neurofeedback training session. And in each of these, there was some benefit. So when we tested them before neurofeedback training versus after, they got better at alerting, they got better at orienting, and they also got better at conflict resolution. The reason this line goes down means that they're not being affected as much by the conflict. So in these three measures of attention, there's preliminary early evidence that we're improving attention. Now this is measuring them on an attention task about a week or two after they finish their training. Finally, we looked at verbal fluency, which is an ability to access your knowledge and your verbal structures. And again, if we look at the sham training subjects, they got a little bit better from practicing before to after training. But this neural feedback group had a huge boost from before to after the training. They got much better at doing this verbal fluency test. Finally, we looked at a working memory test and had some more effects. Just from having done the session twice, this is time number one, time number two, the sham group got a little better, not significantly so. The group that got neural feedback training between this bar and this bar, they improved a lot on their memory. And so the take home message is that some aspects of cognition, cognition decline in aging, while some improve across the lifespan. There's this shift from fluid to crystallized cognition. Uh, changes in large scale brain networks are associated with these changes. We know that. And these changes, it has to do with changes in the interaction of these large scale brain networks. Well, what can we do about it? We're developing neurointervention techniques that can modulate these brain networks and potentially reverse some of these age related cognitive declines. We're doing that with non invasive brain stimulation, like TMS, in the laboratory at this stage. And now we're doing neurofeedback training out there in the real world and having some really uh, exciting initial results. So with that, I will end and thank all my collaborators who worked on these projects listed here. Uh, and I wanna thank RCI Science for putting on the event and inviting us. And thank you, the audience.